Good afternoon. Yes, I want to talk about a very serious subject, video games. And your reaction tells me that to do that, I'm going to start by asking you to park your stereotypes about video games and the people who play them. Because since their inception in the early 1970s and their popularization in the early 1980s, video games have been at the intersection of two profound changes in our society. One is the exponential rise in computational and computing power. The second is in demographic aging, a very linear trend that I'll talk more about in a minute. Now this is the very first console that I ever, ever laid hands on. Yes, I play video games. Yes, I'm 54. Yes, I'm doing this talk because I need to justify that. <laughs> This console was given to me by a professor. I was 18 years old. I was going through a very difficult time in my life. This console with Pac-Man and more importantly, Space Invaders and just a little bit of Missile Command got me through a very difficult period. But it did a lot more than that. It taught me computational thinking. It taught me resilience. It taught me that humans and machines can interact in really remarkable and unpredictable ways. Now, I'm literate. I'm book literate, I'm numerate, but I'm also, I'm happy to say at age 54, machine literate. And I just wish more people my age were. See, the problem is stereotypes get in the way of what we understand about our world. During the 1980s, it was very popular to talk about this rise of computer games as though they were harbingers of evil and doom for young people all over the world. Because after all, only young people played them. And after all, they were all violent. It turns out that through media history, young people adopt media much more quickly and much earlier than older people. And of course, not understanding those media, older people fear what they don't know. And we see this play out in research in fields like psychology. In the 1980s, in the United States in particular, from where I originally come, school shootings were a weekly occurrence. And the best explanation social researchers and psychologists could give for why they were happening was video games. They were on the rise, and so was school shootings. And so models like the one shown in this paper on the screen, the general aggression model, are very good pieces of research. They're powerful models of how and why people respond to media in different ways. The problem is they blinker our thinking. They create, if you will, a kind of block to understand the positive or potential benefit effects of emerging media. So I do research for government and industry. And over the years, I've looked at classification, broadcasting, and video games. And I've had the great pleasure for the past 12 years of running a long-term study. And every time I run the study, I talk to 1,200 people in households, and I find out about over 3,000 people in those households in total. And I can tell you a lot about the people in Australia who play video games. When I started the research, the average age of a video game player was 24. Just last week, I launched the most recent version of this research and announced that the average age of a video game player in Australia today is 34 years of age. This is actually common right around the world. We're not actually very different here in that regard. Okay. So older people play video games. But what's the distribution? Well, if I map age on the Australian Bureau of Statistics bands for, uh, game, for, for age, if I map gameplay on the ABS map for age, here's what I know. You all play, or nine in 10 of you easily. I also know that young people don't play so much. Those one and two year olds dragging the chain, not really picking up the controller. 
I also know that gameplay declines with age. As we age, fewer people play. At least that's the frequency story. I know that 67% of all Australians play video games, and would you believe 43% of people over the age of 65 play? Now, how much do they play? I mean, it's fine to say that 43% of people over the age of 65 play video games. Are they playing much? Well, my results in my research over the last several years has told us what we already know. You people need to get a life. <laughs> If I take those Australian Bureau of Statistics age bands and I place them at the bottom axis and I put minutes up on the side axis, yellow bars are men and boys, blue bars, women and girls. The small dashed lines are casual games, you know, Angry Birds, Fruit Ninja, that stuff. The dashed lines are in-depth games. They're the games that we call AAA titles. Call of Duty, maybe something you know about. And then the solid lines are those two things combined. And so I've demonstrated, not surprisingly, that people your age, people between the ages of, well, in the teenage years, play the most, perhaps too much. I've shown that boys and girls, women and men, both play. I've also shown something that surprised me when I did the numbers two years ago when I did the study. Look at the age of 45 to 50. Women start playing more than men. And then look at the ages around 65. Women increase their gameplay. They've got the men out of the way, and they've got time on their hands. <laughs> Usually when I tell that joke, I'm in an audience of uh, mixed, uh, mixed gender, so men don't usually laugh. <laughs> this is amazing. Older women are increasing the amount of time they spend playing video games as they age. And we have to ask the question, why? Well, I've been measuring this. It's called uses and gratifications research, and I've been measuring this for the past 12 years. And I've shown that younger audiences only play video games, or primarily play video games, for what they're meant for. Entertainment, fun, to pass time, to de-stress. But at age 65, the number one reason people play video games is to keep their minds active. Okay, so video games may serve a purpose that we hadn't thought. For older adults, they might not be just entertainment, they might be serious business. Now, what does that mean then about childhood? Now, there's a lot of research about the effects of video games on children, and most of it is equivocal. The Attorney General's Department in Australia has looked at this and they said, the, mixed, the research is really mixed. In the United States, the Supreme Court considered a case and said, if we're going to be prescriptive with the law, we need to know what the basis of that prescription is. The research is not prescriptive. But we do know one thing. When young people play more video games, they're doing less of the things that as teenagers, we really need them to be doing. Preparing for work in a complex, disrupted digital economy that we've heard about today. They're not playing sport as much. They're not reading as much. They're not using other media as much, and that might be important. And they're not getting enough sleep. But it's different for older people. The covariate benefits, that is to say, the things that can improve as older people play more video games, are actually quite many. They have more time on their hands, so displacement isn't the problem. They can obtain social benefits, neuroplasticity, cognitive benefits, positive affect, moods, happiness, and a positive outlook on life. Now, over the years, I've asked my participants in my research to tell me why they play video games. And I've picked out five quotes for you today that just give you a picture of older people playing. 
This first one. By playing games, I hope to keep my mind active and ward off dementia, a female age 72. I am 80 years old and have a medical condition that restricts my movements. To keep my mind working, I play games where I have to find objects to keep the story going. I think I will have to do more of this activity in the future. Male, 80. Two things straight away. A future and a plan. I have developed a closer relationship with my grandchildren playing video games with them. Male, age 67. Sounds good to me. Games keep my brain active in my senior years and hopefully delay any dementia. They also provide some satisfaction when completed successfully and fill the time in my stay-at-home days. Male, 79. Because after all, we're not always out and about. And if we're at home, maybe we'll want to just have fun or indeed engage in something challenging. But this is my favorite. I simply like to indulge in a fantasy game where I can be what I want to be without reference to other people's opinions or constraints. I want to be a hero insofar as I'm concerned. Male, 63. Good on you. <laughs> Say hello to Winston. The game is Overwatch. I've said 43% of people over the age of 63 play, a uh, 65 play. What happened to the other 57%? Maybe characters in the fantastic world of games is just a bit off-putting. But note, Winston has spectacles. Yes, he's an ape scientist. That's a bit odd. But he is an older character. And we're starting to see older characters enter the world of video games because older people are playing. And it's really interesting to me to think about where games are going and what they can actually offer people who play them. And do they offer anything? Well, in 2013, in the respected journal Nature, scientists from the University of California published an amazing study that was, that was presented on the cover of Nature itself. The headline from the article tells you what they found. Video gaming enhances cognitive skills that decline with age. With over 100 participants over the age of 60, actually between the ages of 60 and 80, they had them play a game that they designed called Neuro Racer, basically a driving game. They had them play that game over a period of weeks for up to 12 hours. And then they compared their multitasking abilities with other people. After 12 hours playing Neuro Racer, those 60 to 80 year olds had better multitasking capabilities than 20 year olds who hadn't played the game and they had better multitasking capabilities than 60 to 80 year olds who hadn't played the game. They also showed that a lighting up of the prefrontal cortex meant that they could make critical decisions better. Again, at the age of a 20 something. So games are obviously capable of offering something more than just passing the time, having fun and de-stressing. So here we are at a point when human-computer interaction is taking off. Games are getting more capability. More people are playing them. Artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and a wide spread of tools like tablets and phones are enabling people to be more resilient. And is that important? Well, demographic aging is one of the most challenging things that we face today. Researchers have demonstrated in the, science, in the journal Science that since 1840, we have added two to three months of life to the average human lifespan every year that has passed. We are living twice as long as we did in the 1840s. Some of that change is because of medicine. We have better infant mortality. We have the capacity to sustain life longer. And we're actually, in absolute terms, apparently, living longer. Scientists have just revised the upward limit on the potential for human life from 115 to 125. Half of you in this room will live to over 100. So 
As we start to think about what you do in the old world of retirement from 65 to 100, we have to think about how you, we all, can be enabled. See, our thinking about aging is that our abilities decline with age. But the exponential growth of information and communication technologies personalized in our pockets means that we could perhaps leverage the tools for a greater purpose. We can game aging. Yes, that's a pun. We can use games to actually help us age better. And aging better is really important. Successful aging and aging well is talked about quite a bit just at the moment in the um, uh, geriatrics and gerontology literature. There are three things we need to age well. We need to maintain cognitive and physical functioning. We need to maintain uh, connection with life and the changes in our society. And we need to ensure that we have our, um, our, our, our well-being looked after through um, good, uh, good services, good connections with um, what's available to us. Sorry, had a blank. So what do games potentially do in responding to the various aspects of positive aging? Well, it turns out that after operations, playing a video game reduces reported pain, subjective pain, increases optimism, and decreases recovery time. Games that require puzzle solving increase memory and learning. Games that ask us to look for and shoot things in an environment actually increase greater sensory movement, so we can see things more clearly. We, see, we, we, we grasp things that are moving in their environment. Games can improve decision making, and through puzzle solving, we can actually solve problems more quickly if we repeat those puzzles. Winning a game, beating a level, improves self-efficacy, pride, and feelings of reward. Increased control and planning capacity can come from moving through a complex world and map. And we can increase our positive mood and promote relaxation and reduce anxiety through simple games like Angry Birds and Fruit Ninja. And what about younger players? Well, it turns out that the best amount of playtime is about an hour a day. After that, there are costs. Regulated time play for an hour a day increases happiness improves sociability, and lowers hyperactivity. Over that amount of time, dehydration, deep vein thrombosis, irritability, poor grades, and of course, family and social conflict ensue. Just a few weeks ago, the newspaper The Economist published a special series on the economics of longevity. And it said that we invented teenagers in the 1800s because we recognize there's a special period in which young people have to be prepared for the economy. And the time can't be wasted. But we also have longevity that requires us now to think about what happens before we actually retire, when we reduce work but don't stop work. They've invented the term pretirees. So pretirees are going to have more time on their hands. And maybe that time could be spent playing video games. Thank you.